Thank you for the kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Does that work? Great. Okay. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's awesome to be here. Uh, now it's my turn. We heard great talks this morning. Sorry, I'm going to drag it down from now on. Um, now it's my turn to tell you a little bit about the work that goes on in our lab, all of which, one way or another, revolves around the origins of novelty and development and evolution. And this is a really broad topic, so we break it down along what we call seven dimensions of innovation and diversification in the natural world. And we enlist in this a diverse cast of insect model systems. So for instance, we do work on fireflies and their magnificent light-producing lanterns to explore the very origins of novel complex traits and the developmental evolution of size, shape, and positioning. We've done some work on tree hoppers and their <coughs> crazy helmets to address some of the same questions, uh, but also add to this an, a research program into the developmental evolution of sex differences. However, we do most of our work on beetles and their horns, where, again, we address all of these questions, but also explore the origins and diversification of environment-sensitive development. And then we have efforts to explore the developmental evolution of phenotypic integration. Complex traits are called complex because they often have behavioral, physiological, morphological components. These ought to be integrated. That integration, of course, itself evolves, but may have the potential to feed back on subsequent diversification. That's what we are interested in. And then we shift gears and explore innovation through team building. When organisms form collectives, symbioses, where a collective can go places, can innovate in ways that individual components cannot. And we explore innovation via environment engineering or niche construction, when organisms innovate not just by evolving new traits to meet environmental challenges, but by finding ways to modify their environment to suit the traits they already possess. So today, I hope to tell you two sets of case studies that hopefully will address most of these dimensions. Before I do this, I owe you a justification, though, for why anyone would bother exploring these topics using beetles and their horns. So there are basically four major reasons uh, that go into this. Number one, beetle horns are major structures. There's nothing subtle about them. They dominate their bearers, not just morphologically, but also behaviorally, where they function as weapons in male-male competition and help delineate the behavioral ecology of individuals and populations. Beetle horns are highly diverse on a variety of levels and for different proximate reasons. What do I mean by this? Uh, in this column, I'm showing you the large male phenotypes across five species that we maintain in continuous culture in the lab. And you can see that they all differ in the size, location, and shape of horns. And you can look at this as a manifestation of evolved, canalized differences between species. In the next column, I'm showing you the corresponding females, which, with one exception, are hornless. Here's one species that has this enigmatic reverse sexual dimorphism. And Sex differences now, depending on species, can be severe, modest, severe again, but involving a different body region, modest and reversed. And again, we can look at this as a manifestation of canalized differences following XX, XY sex determination. And in the last column now, I'm showing you the phenotypes of males which during their larval development had access to suboptimal nutritional conditions. And in some cases, these differences are so severe and discrete that we arrive at alternative male morphs, much less so in this species. Again, alternative male morphs, much less so in this species. And here we have a secondary loss. In this column, variation is a product of plastic development due to nutritional conditions experienced during larval development. OK, last but not least, beetle horns lack obvious homology. At least that's what we thought until not too long ago. And I'll tell you that story today. To other traits in insects and non-insect arthropods, they're not modified legs or mouth parts. Instead, they exist alongside these structures. And we, can, we should therefore be able to look at them legitimately as a evolutionary novelty, which since its invention has undergone one of the most extreme degrees of diversification. By the way, this species is about yay long. Uh, it can fly, uh, not gracefully, but it can. OK. So on to our first case study on innovation and diversification. This one's going to focus on the origins of thoracic beetle horns. And I'm going to tell you this story in two phases. Phase one is work driven by Andrew Shelby, at the time an undergraduate in the lab, and Tammy Cruikshanks, a graduate student, this work is published and done. Phase two is currently ongoing. 
uh, powered by Yong Gong Hu and David Linz, both of whom are here. So if I mess things up, they will fix it, and they would love to talk to you more about this, I'm sure. Okay, so uh, here's what I need you to know going into this. Thoracic beetle horns are a striking innovation emerging from the first thoracic segment of beetles. Um, here are just six of literally thousands exam of examples of thoracic horns. The other thing I want you to know, though, is that innovation on T1, the first thoracic segment, isn't limited to horns. Other crazy things happen there, like color patterns or whatever that is, or these projections, or this antenna that the tree hopper uses to send signals to its home planet. Because what else would you do with this thing? All right. But this is where our story really starts. So this is a phylogeny published by Doug Emlin and colleagues in 2005 in evolution of 48 Ontophagus species. There are over 2,000 species in this genus. This is just the best phylogeny we have at the moment. And mapped onto this phylogeny, on the left for males, on the right for females, is the occurrence of thoracic horns. Okay. And based on this reconstruction and analysis, Emlin and colleagues concluded correctly so, that in order to explain present-day patterns of diversification, the most parsimonious explanation requires nine independent origins of thoracic horns in males and seven in females. That's, that's extraordinary, but it's the, the, the correct conclusion if all you have access to are adult phenotypes. Things became interesting, though, when we started to rear these guys in captivity. I'm showing you here onto Fagus by notice which in this phylogeny is labeled as having a thoracic horn oops, only in males, but not in females. But if you look at the corresponding male and female pupa, they both have a thoracic horn. It's just that she, after turning pupa, bombards it with programmed cell death and resorbs it before turning into a thorax hornless adult. We found the same pattern in Antophagus hecate, which I'm not going to show you, and then we looked at Antophagus taurus. This is a species that, has, that lacks thoracic horns in both sexes in the adult. But if you look at the pupae, they both make pronounced thoracic horns. Now it's just that both of them resorb them prior, uh, before they turn adults. We found that same pattern in four more species within that phylogeny. In fact, we found that same pattern in 22 more species that are not part of this phylogeny, but they all have no thoracic horn as adults, but they all have them during the pupil stage. So to us, that signaled that perhaps rather than postulating nine or seven independent origins of thoracic horns, maybe thoracic horns only evolved once at the base of this clade, and what truly diversified was a given lineage's ability to retain or resorb the horn before turning into an adult. All right. That, of course, begs the question, why bother? Why go through the trouble of growing this thing as a pupa? This, I'm showing you an animal that's about to molt into an adult when all you do with it is resorb the structure and turn into a thoracic hornless adult. Specifically, we were wondering, could it be that these structures have a utility beyond being the pupal precursors of an adult weapon? Is there something else they do? Well, one hypothesis that suggested itself fairly early was that these structures prior to becoming pupil horns may play a role in the molting process. Okay, let me walk you through this. What you see here is a sagittal section this way through the head and first thoracic segment. Here's the head. Here's the first thoracic segment of an animal that is about to molt from larva to pupa. Shown in blue is the epidermis and highlighted here in red is the thoracic horn as it's unfolding underneath. The thoracic cuticle is thin, paper thin and membranous, but the head capsule is incredibly thick and hard. It needs to be that because this is where jaw muscles anchor themselves during larval life. I want you to focus on this region here, which I'm uh, blowing up here. And I would like you to see how the tip of this thoracic horn is inserting itself into this empty space vacated between the head epidermis and the head capsule. If I would have fixed this animal a few hours later, that tip would have been over here, and it also would have broadened out. Intriguingly, if you watch an animal head on as it molts from la larva to pupa, the first thing that breaks through the larval head is not the head. It's actually the thoracic horn that plows its way through that head capsule, breaking it open at these preformed suture lines. 
So the idea was born that perhaps, yes, these are molting devices. That's something we, of course, had to put to the test. So develop a method that allowed us to destroy the larval precursor cells that normally would give rise to the thoracic horn. If we succeed, we should be producing pupae that don't have a thoracic horn. And if our hypothesis is correct, these pupae should now also still retain their larval head capsule. And that's exactly what we found. Uh, you can replicate this experiment quantitatively from a derived species like on the Fagus binotis to a more basal species like on the Fagus gazella. You get the same outcome. Thoracic horns matter for molting. And then we took it just outside the genus to uh, the genus Oniticellus. There are no major thoracic horns there, but you can do the same surgery. When you do that, they don't care. They can shed their larval head capsule just fine. So collectively, that first phase taught us that prepupal thoracic horns indeed facilitate the shedding of the larval head capsule and that that would explain the maintenance of horn development in larvae despite the absence of horns in adults. Looks like this dual function is idiosyncratic to the genus Ontophagus. And therefore, more generally, that thoracic horns may have evolved initially as an adaptation to larval and pupil development and only secondarily became exapted to become precursors of adult weapons. For us, this was a major insight and advancement. But it also left us a little dissatisfied because in some ways we thought all we've done really is push it one step back in time. Clearly, the question now is, how then did pupil horns originate? OK, so now I would like to introduce you to phase two. This is work by David Linz and Yong Hu that's currently ongoing. And because this work is ongoing and because some of it is currently under review, I'm going to ask you to not tweet about it, if possible. OK, um, here we got help from an unexpected source. This is the red flower beetle, Tribolium castanium. It turns out that Yangon and David are both uh, experts in the origin of insect wings, perhaps the most enigmatic novelty insects have ever been able to produce. And their work and that of others has shown that several what we would call normally wing master genes, genes like vestigial, but also apterous, disheveled, and abrupt, are not only critical for the formation of bona fide fore and hind wings, but they're also critical for the formation of structures that have nothing to do with wings, at least superficially. For instance, in the first thoracic segment, you find the carinated margin and the pleural plates, and these structures are compromised when you mess with the expression of these genes. Moreover, if you transform the first thoracic segment through downregulation of the Hox gene sex comes reduced towards T2 identity, the second thoracic segment, which normally bears wings, you find that these structures grow out, fuse, and produce ectopic wings in the wrong segment. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, their work has also been able to show that these wing serial homologs, structures that are affected by the same gene networks and derive from homologous source tissues, can also be observed in each of the abdominal segment. All I want you to take away from this is that this fueled the hypothesis that perhaps thoracic horns in our beetles represent T1 wing serial homologs. So as a first approach, we went ahead and knocked down each of these major wing regulatory genes. And when we knock down vestigial, the wings get compromised. You can't see that here, but the thoracic horn goes poof. Same for apterus, same for disheveled, same for abrupt. Thoracic horn is gone. Okay. Next step, when we, well, next observation was that if we uh, only partly compromise the expression of these genes, we see a reduction of this medial thoracic horn to paired and lateral, bilateral structures, uh, which tells us that perhaps during development, a medial thoracic horn ultimately originates from bilateral source tissues. And lastly, when we knock down sex comps reduced, not only do we get the induction of ectopic wings in our beetles, as you can see here, we also see the loss of thoracic horns. And moreover, and then Yongon and David did something that I thought was truly brilliant. They knocked down a gene called paneer, and paneer has nothing to do with wing formation, but it does delete the thoracic horns. It deletes basically midline structures. And our reasoning was that if, we, if thoracic horns are truly homologous to wings, and if we delete thoracic horns first and now induce ectopic wings, 
the resulting ectopic wings should be a lot smaller. And that's exactly what we found. Okay, so collectively, all this work supports the hypothesis that the same tissues that build horns normally or also generate ectopic wings in the absence of SCR function. So the second phase, still ongoing, still lots of work to do, told us that evolution of thoracic horns was initiated in the first place through the repurposing of wing serial homologs and that we speculate that the reuse of these wing serial homologs underlies much of the innovation seen in this particular body region and may exert a bias in towards why this body region in particular has proliferated in crazy ways, giving rise to this exorbitant diversity of structures. And more generally, these results to us question the wisdom of the most widely used definition of novelty, which goes back to Gerd Miller and Gunther Wagner, you need to satisfy the absence of homology and homonymy. Instead, our results show that striking morphology, morphological novelty, rather than emerge in the absence of homology, may be instead initiated through it. There's a lot more to these stories. And if you want to learn more about it, please go see Yangong's talk tomorrow, uh, where you will learn everything you wanted to know about the role of wing serial homologs in insect innovation, and then some. You may have noticed many of these beetles have horns on their heads. Everything I told you today about thoracic horns, none of it applies to the head. Innovation in the head follows a completely different mode. And if you want to learn more about it, go to David Lintz's talk again tomorrow. And if you're interested in the innovation not of structure but of function, go see Sophia's talk in just a little bit today this afternoon. All right. What I would like to do next is shift gears and move on to innovation through team, team building and innovation through environment engineering. When organisms build collectives and when organisms systematically modify the environment that surrounds them in order to innovate in evolutionarily significant ways. Here in particular, I would like to introduce you to the work of Daniel Schwab, Sophia Casasa, and Eric Parker, three current or former grad students in the lab, and Irene Newton, a uh, colleague in the microbiology section of my department. And in particular, I want to focus on the Antophagus microbiome and the role of co-development and its construction in horned beetle evodivo. Okay, what am I talking about? Oh, and by the way, tweet away. Um, let me step back and give you a little bit more of an introduction. Um, all the beetles we work on are horned beetles, but they also are dung beetles, meaning they depend during larval life and adult life uh, on dung as a food source. Now, dung is a crappy diet. Oh, and I should walk you through the, the, the life cycle first. Uh, the way this works in these guys is they fly to a dung pad, they dig a tunnel, they pull pieces of dung into the tunnel and turn them into these brood balls. Each brood ball receives one egg only, egg hatches into a larva, larva consumes the brood ball, completes all development inside of it, and after some four to 10 weeks, depending on species, a new adult beetle emerges. So, as I said, however, dung is a crappy diet. Uh, you can think of it as a food that someone already ate once, and it wasn't that great to begin with. It's very rich in uh, hard to digest polysaccharides, uh, low in amino acids, so the question is, what does it take to deal with such a challenging diet? Uh, here's the answer of one of my former postdocs. It takes courage <laughs> and guts. Uh, this dissection that he conducted shows a larva with all its gut taken out. I want you to see how enormously large that structure is. And I agree, it definitely takes guts. But it probably takes more than that. It turns out that mothers provide more than just food for their offspring. Those in the back may not be able to see this, but those in front, I hope you can see that this egg doesn't just sit there, it actually sits on a little pedestal. It turns out that when mom lays an egg, before she does that, she actually produces a little bit of fecal matter herself. Think of it as like dung beetle dung. She takes a dump and then she takes her egg and goes, puts it on top. Okay, and when the egg hatches, the first thing that that resulting larva does is eat that pedestal, thereby inoculating itself with a maternally derived microbiome, which we now know is faithfully transmitted from mother to offspring. It is distinct from microbiome found in the cow, the dung, the soil, or the brood ball. And we 
subsequently developed ways to manipulate its presence and absence and composition, which now allowed us to investigate various aspects of the dimension of host beetle microbiome interactions. And that's what I would like to focus on for the remainder of my talk. Uh, specifically, the first question we ask, does it matter? Uh, does it actually enhance fitness? And the answer is yes. If you deprive larvae of their natural source of their microbiome, then, or if you provide it to them, as in these micro plus individuals, they reach uh, pupil development faster and they arrive at ultimately larger body sizes compared to animals, micro minus, who, uh, from whom their natural source of their microbiome was withheld. Second question we ask, are we sure this is, about, this is all due to microbes? I mean, could it be that there's like some super nutrient in, the, in this pedestal? We're now sure it's the microbiome because it turns out a lot of the pedestal microbiome can be cultivated on petri dishes outside the body of these animals. You can scrape it down, you can dilute it appropriately and return it to a germ-free larva, thereby rescuing the otherwise negative effects it would face. So individuals that receive what we call a pedestal inoculate develop faster and larger than individuals that receive some random soil inoculate or none at all. Is the microbiome function dependent on conditions such as stress? Uh, yes. It turns out when we impose two ecologically relevant stressors such as desiccation or temperature fluctuations, they're both ecologically relevant in the context of dung beetle development. We find that your microbiome matters regardless, but it especially matters if you make uh, things hard for developing larvae. You can imagine that something like temperature fluctuations uh, could have started with a faulty incubator. Uh, we've since quantitatively followed up, and indeed, you need your microbiome even under very good conditions, but under severe temperature fluctuations, you need it even more. Okay. Are different host species adapted to host-specific microbiomes? Yes. Uh, this is work that is basically at the early stages, but in one experiment on the Fagus gazella larvae that were inoculated with their own microbiome, shown here, as opposed to that of a closely related congener, developed faster and to larger body sizes. This effect over here uh, also persisted into the uh, transgenerationally, as you might predict if your now incorrect microbiome is faithfully passed on to the next generation. And we also observed a major effect on survival. In one species, that effect was measurable but non significant. In the other one, it was highly significant. Okay, is microbiome function restricted to the gut? Why would we even ask such a question? Uh, let me confront you with a couple of observations. Number one, larvae don't just eat their brood ball. They poop into it. They work their excrement into the brood ball. Then they eat the mixture. Then they do it again and again. They also mechanically modify their brood ball. They repair it. They build a pupation chamber. If you withhold these brood ball modifying behaviors by moving a larva every 48 hours into a brand new, wonderful brood ball, they pay a price. Those that are allowed to benefit from the accrual of their niche construction behaviors arrive at larger body sizes compared to those where they are being removed from. That is something we see in Ontophagus taurus. It's also significant in Ontophagus gazella, though less extreme, and it's absent in Ontophagus sagittarius. And here I'm just showing you effects on body size, but these effects also extend to survival um, sex differences, which are diminished or absent, uh, altered scaling relationships. So immediately, we are wondering what might be a mechanism behind this. And we have at least a, a decently supported hypothesis. What we've done is we went ahead and collected microbiota from brood balls that were allowed to be modified by our larva versus brood balls that were just allowed to sit there. And then we gave them various carbon sources to digest and ask, what is the portfolio of carbon sources that these microbiota can digest? And we find that those that come from a brood ball that larvae have worked on are much more capable in digesting a wide range of carbon sources. So what we are thinking is going on is that by working their dung 
their own poop into the brood ball. They are creating what we call an external rumen that predigests their food prior to ingestion by the larva. Okay. Are there other potential microbiome functions? Is it all about food and nutrition? No. It turns out that beetles develop with a great diversity of fungi, uh, many of which look quite beautiful. These are various isolates from, uh, from brood balls and surrounding environments. Some of them can kill you. So this is an Ontophagus nigroventris pupa, and this is that same pupa 48 hours later. Uh, because it suffered a metarhizium infection, which turned it into fungus farm. Okay. Um, the question was born, or the hypothesis was created, does the microbiome protect you against fungal attacks? And the answer is yes. Here I'm showing you uh, uh, mortality curves of individuals larvae inoculated with PBS versus a random field microbiome versus a microbiome derived from mum. And clearly, the presence of maternally derived microbiota significantly reduces mortality in these organisms in response to metarhizium infections. All right, almost done. As if this wasn't already complicated enough. In closing, I want to introduce you to the work of these guys, Chris Ledenreddick and Eric Ragsdale, uh, who convinced me that it turns out it may not just be about host and microbiome. There may also be macro uh, organisms involved in the process besides our beetles. Uh, specifically, they convinced me or they identified that there are nematodes whose life cycle is faithfully synchronized with the life cycle of our beetles. When the beetles are adults, the nematodes sit there and don't do anything uh, and are in a dour stage. When the beetle is an egg, they become active and do whatever it is they do. When the animal turns pupa, they switch back to dower stages and then hop onto the other beetle prior to its departure from the boot ball. There are several such nematode species, and it turns out that they like to hang out on species-specific body regions. We found one nematode species that always sits under the elytra, the wing covers, and we found another one that likes to hang out on the male copulatory organ called the adiagus. Okay, and what I'm showing you here, and I hope this works, is a dissected adiagus, male copulatory organ, and you're looking at the tip. So this is the structure that will be inserted into the female during copulation, and these are the nematodes that inhabit that copulatory organ. We now know that these nematodes are transmitted during sexual intercourse. They're also transmitted from females onto eggs after oviposition. Uh, this is the nematode, Diplogastralis monohistroides, the nematode specialists in the world tell us that this is a bacterial predator. Here's a tooth with which it eats its bacterial prey. Uh, I didn't know this, but it turns out that insect brood chamber nematode associations are really common. Just nobody really knows what they do, if anything. So we developed a method that allows us to kind of like germ-free larvae. We now can have nematode-free larvae and inoculate them with the nematode of our choice at whatever stage we want to. And when we do that, long story short, we find that the presence of the nematode significantly enhances the weight of larvae and the mass gain or growth rate of the larvae. This is a sexually transmitted mutualist that benefits developing on the phagus larvae, and it does so, or at least this is associated with significant and consistent skews in the bacterial and fungal communities that inhabit the brood ball. All right, let me try to summarize the second part. I hope to have shown you here that in our dung beetles, the microbiome promotes host growth, especially under stressful conditions. That beetle hosts and their microbiome reciprocally construct each other's developmental environment, and that the functional significance of larval and adult niche construction diversify across host species. And last but not least, I've shown you that these Diplogastrellus nematodes are vertically and sexually transmitted mutualists, which further promote host growth via microbiome engineering. Okay. More generally, oh, if you want to learn more about this, go see poster 31 by Eric Parker with a little help from my friends, which puts this even further into the direction of um, the role of microbial communities in uh, range expansions and ecological radiations. Okay, more generally, 
I hope to have shown you today that beetle horns and horned beetles offer a rich and complex microcosm for exploring the mechanics of innovation and diversification in a natural world. Um, as always, I want to use this as an opportunity to recruit more people to work on these organisms. My lab is the only one that pursues these organisms the way we do, and there's so much more that can be done with them. So if you're a graduate student and you're looking for a project, consider these organisms. If you're a postdoc and you'd like a second leg to stand on, consider these organisms. Uh, if you're a faculty and you're just no longer that excited about butterfly wing patterns or... <laughs> The price equation is no longer keeping you up at night. 2,400 species in a single genus can't be wrong. OK. With this, I would like to thank my many collaborators. I would like to thank our funding sources. Uh, without none of them, uh, this would have been possible. And I would like to thank a couple of people without whom I wouldn't be here. And lastly, thanks to all of you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions.